that's attached by one single string to a 5 kilogram mass. Now we assume as before that the mass of this string is essentially zero. We will start by looking at the forces on this section of string. Now we look at the forces on the string first of all, that enables us to consider the forces on the mass on the pulley. So let's suppose that the force on this end of the string due to the 5 kilogram mass has magnitude t, that's vertically down. Now we will look at the resultant force along this section of string, the section highlighted in blue. Well, we know that that's the mass of the string times the acceleration of the string, but the mass of the string is zero, we are saying. So the resultant force along this piece of string is zero. Of course, there is a force on this string due to, due to the pulley. The pulley exerts a force on the string at each point in a direction that's perpendicular to the string. So this force has no component along the string. So we forget about those forces. We're only interested in forces along the string. We also have the weight of the string, but we know that that's zero since we're assuming the mass is zero. Okay, since the resultant force along the string is zero, we see that the force on the end of the string, of this section of the string that just meets this movable pulley, must have the same magnitude as this force. So this force also has magnitude t. It's t minus t will give us zero. And that's what we want. We want a resultant force of zero along the string. Now all we've got to do is apply Newton's third law. The force on this end of the string due to the 5 kilogram mass is t down. So the force on the 5 kilogram mass due to the string must be t up. It's equal but opposite. Similarly over here, the force on this end of the blue section of string due to the remainder of the string is t down. So the force on the blue, um, sorry, the force on the other section of the string due to the blue part must be t up. Now in a similar way we could look at this green section of string. Okay, the green section of string ends at this point here. Um, this is the point where the string just meets this 3 kilogram pulley. And we can apply the same reasoning, you know, the force on this end of it is T down. And uh, so the force at the other end must be T up because the green section of string has no mass. You know, the entire string has no mass, so obviously any section of it has no mass. So, um, you know, we can say the force up here is has magnitude t. Indeed, we could go further and say the force on the ceiling due to this piece of string has magnitude t. And uh, we have two forces acting down here on the piece of string that's in contact with this pulley. And these forces also have magnitude t. So the tension is the same throughout the entire string. Now these two tension forces act on the part of the string that's in contact with this pulley here. But we could say that this part of the string that's in contact with the pulley is part of this pulley. Its mass is zero. So that means we can say that these two forces act on the three kilogram pulley. Part of the string that's in contact with the pulley and the pulley itself move with the same acceleration, of course, because they're connect they're, they remain connected. As for the other two forces, well, those are the weights of the pulley and the mass. Now let's consider the accelerations of these two particles. It's clear that the 5 kilogram mass moves down while the 3 kilogram mass moves up. However, the accelerations of these two particles are not the same. To see why that is so, consider what would happen if we, the 5 kilogram mass moves down by 1 meter. Let's suppose it moves down to here, a distance of one meter. Well, the three kilogram mass is obviously going to move up. Now, so the string on this side of the system moves down a distance of one meter. So that means that this distance plus this distance here must add up to one meter. So we've taken one meter of string out of this side of the system and put it into the right side. Um, so that means we've taken a half meter of string from each side of this system. Let's call the distance moved by the 5 kilogram mass S sub 5. So S is normally used for distance. Well, 
uh, we see that that distance, S sub 5, is twice the distance moved by the 3 kilogram mass. That's the, that the, I'm calling the distance moved by the 3 kilogram mass S sub 3. Well, we could consider the rate of change of those two distances. Take the derivative with respect to time, and that gives us the velocity. So the velocity of the 5 kilogram mass is going to be twice the velocity of the 3 kilogram mass at any instant. We can take the rate of change of the velocities with respect to time to get the acceleration. So we see that at any instant, the acceleration of the 5 kilogram mass is twice the acceleration of the 3 kilogram mass. Um, the accelerations are actually constant. Okay, A5 is fixed, it doesn't change, and A3 is fixed. However, the velocities vary, of course, and obviously the distances vary too. Um, the accelerations are constant because we have constant forces acting on the two particles. Okay, so I'll call the acceleration of the 3 kilogram mass A. I won't call it A3, but if the acceleration of the 3 kilogram mass is A up, we know that the acceleration of the 5 kilogram mass is twice A down. Now we can solve the system. So let's look at the resultant force on the 3 kilogram mass. Well, it's 2T up and 3G down. So by Newton's second law, that's equal to the mass times the acceleration, where the acceleration of the 3 kilogram mass is A. Now let's get the force on the 5 kilogram mass. So downwards is positive for the 5 kilogram mass, that's the direction of the acceleration. So it's 5g minus t by Newton's second law, that's mass, which is 5 times the acceleration, which is 2a. So to solve the system, we only need to multiply this by 2 and add this equation onto the top equation. So the t's cancel and we end up getting a equals 7 over 23 times g. Okay, I've subbed this into the top equation to get the tension t. Okay, so that means that the upwards force on this pulley is 2 times 1.96 g, which is 3.91 g. You can clearly see that um, 2t is greater than the weight of the pulley. And over here, you can see that the weight of this mass, 5g, is greater than t. Now let's look at a general situation in which we do not know the, the direction in which the system moves. So we have this movable pulley A whose mass is m kilograms, and then we have this mass attached to the end of the string whose mass is m1 kilograms. Now we can choose any direction we like for the acceleration of either of these objects, since of course we don't know in which um, direction they accelerate. Let's suppose that the m1 kilogram mass um, accelerates downwards, and this one accelerates upwards. So let's call the acceleration of this one a. And we know from the previous part that if a accelerates upwards with acceleration a, then this mass accelerates downwards with acceleration 2 times a. So like before, we have the string tension, which I'm calling t, and we have the weights of the two objects. Okay, let's get the resultant force on A. So I will take upwards as positive for A because we are saying that A is accelerating upwards. So we'll take the direction of the acceleration to be the positive direction. It's more convenient. So we have T plus T upwards, which is plus 2T, and we've minus Mg down. And by Newton's second law, that's mass times acceleration, where the acceleration is A. Let's look at the resultant force on B. Let's take downwards to be positive for B. That's the direction of it's ex or sorry, not be this mass. Um, that's the direction of its acceleration. So uh, we have plus m1g acting downwards. We have minus t. And by Newton's second law, that's the mass of this object, which is m1, times its acceleration, which is 2a. So the quickest way to solve this, just like before, actually, is to multiply all this equation by 2 and um, this will become a 4a. Now, by adding both sides, we cancel the t's, and we can solve for a. So, we have a general formula for the acceleration of this kind of system. So, as an aside, let's look at this formula for um, particular cases. Let's see when a is zero. 
Now if the acceleration is zero, then the system doesn't move. Well, if a is zero, then the numerator, what's on top, must be zero. So 2m1 minus m must be zero. In other words, twice m1 must equal m. Okay? Um, so the system will not accelerate if the mass of the moving pulley is double this mass. Let's look at the situation where A is positive. Now, if A is positive, well, the system will move in the direction shown. In other words, the movable pulley A will move upwards, and this mass will move down. So, for A to be positive, well, the numerator has to be positive, because the denominator is automatically positive. It's plus 4m1 plus m, and the g is obviously positive. So if the numerator is positive, well, it means that twice m1 has to be greater than m. So, for example, if m is 3 kilograms and let's say m1 is 2 kilograms, well, the system, the 2 kilogram mass will still move down, even though it's lighter than the 3 kilogram mass. That's because 2 times m1 is 4, whereas m is just 3. 4 is greater than 3. So we can use this lighter mass of 2 kilograms to raise a heavier mass of 3 kilograms. But of course, the um, compensation for that is that, you know, if we move this down one meter, well, the three kilogram mass is only going to move up half a meter. But of course, you can say that at least we can use this smaller mass to lift the greater mass. Finally, let's look at the situation where A is less than zero. A is negative. Well, A will be negative when the numerator is negative. So 2m1 minus m will be less than zero. In other words, 2m1 will be less than m. Say, for example, that m1 is 2 kilograms and m is 6 kilograms. Well, 2 times m1, that's 2 times 2 is 4 in this case, is less than 6. So in that case, the system will accelerate in the opposite direction. A comes out to be negative. So if A comes out to be negative, well then, this mass will move down, accelerate down, and mass M1 will accelerate up. That's because for this mass, upwards is positive. So if we get a negative value for A, it means that um, this mass, this pulley is moving down. Whereas for the other mass, downwards is positive in the direction of the acceleration, so getting a negative value for 2a means that this mass moves up. A block A of mass 4 kilograms can slide on a rough horizontal table. If its mass is 4 kilograms, its weight is 4g, and because it's in contact with this table, there's a force on the block due to the table of magnitude 4g vertically up. That's because there's no acceleration in the vertical direction. The block is connected inelastically to a pulley system from which B, a mass of 8 kilograms, hangs freely under gravity. So the weight of B is 8G. Okay, um, we have a light inelastic string. Light means, basically, we're saying its mass is zero. Um, its inelastic means it's inextensible. Now let's look at the forces on the system due to the string. Well, let's suppose that the force on B due to the string has magnitude T, and of course that's going to be vertically up along the string. Um, it's going to be a force on B, away from B, along the string. Now we saw previously that this force, or this tension, is the same throughout the string. So the force on this pulley due to the string is actually 2T. We have T here, and we have another T here just like we saw previously. Now, it's assumed here that the mass is zero, even though it doesn't say in the question, but, you know, if the mass is not zero, well, we would have to, um, the force of 2t would be acting on this pulley and this block, and we'd have to know the total mass. And uh, we know nothing about this pulley, so we assume its mass is zero. We do know the mass of block A. A horizontal force P of 320 newtons is applied to the mass at A. 
Um, okay, so the mass A moves in the direction of P. So we know we actually know the direction of the acceleration of A. So let's call the acceleration of A little a. So that's pointing to the right. Now we must also consider the friction force on the block. Well, since we know the direction of motion of the block, which, which is to the right, the friction force opposes that motion, so the friction force must be pointing to the left. And we know that when something is moving, or on the verge of moving, the maximum friction force is acting. And the maximum friction force is the coefficient of friction mu multiplied by the uh, force of the surface on the block, which is 4g. So we have 4 sevenths multiplied by 4g. Okay, so that's 16g over 7. Okay, we want the acceleration of A. So let's get the resultant force on A. Well, the acceleration of A is to the right, so we'll take that direction as the positive direction for convenience. So this force of 320 newtons is positive. Um, and we have these force, these three forces actually. We have a force of T plus T or 2T acting to the left, so that's minus 2T, and the friction force is negative. And that must equal the mass times the acceleration. Well, the mass is 4. The acceleration, we are saying, is A. Um, so that's the resultant force. The vertical forces add up to 0. Now let's get the resultant force on B. Well, since A moves to the right, it is clear that B must move up. So the acceleration of B must be upwards. Okay, it's, we assume it starts at rest and uh, it's accelerating upwards. Um, so the force on it is plus T minus 8G. And that's its mass, which is 8 times its acceleration. Now what is its acceleration? Now we have the same kind of situation as we saw previously. Um, you know, like imagine B moves up one a distance of one meter. Well, what's going to happen to A? One meter's worth of string, one a length of one meter of string gets fed into this pulley here, and uh, that's divided in two. So, if this bit of string decreases by one meter, well. Um, you know, this piece here increases by one meter, this loop of string here. But if it increases by one meter, that's a half meter on each side. Okay, so we had a half meter here and a half meter here. So we've assumed that it's after moving up one meter. So that means that this pulley was originally here and now it's moved by half a meter to the right. So as we saw in the previous example, if that's if that's the situation, the acceleration of B must be twice the acceleration of A. So the resultant force is 8 times 2A. Okay, so we have two equations and two unknowns, just like we saw previously. And uh, to solve between them, we can multiply this one by 2. That ensures that when we add, we cancel the tensions. Um, 16 sevenths is 2 and 2 sevenths plus 16 is 18 and 2 sevenths. Uh, so anyway, solving we get A equals 3.91 meters per second squared. So the acceleration of the block. The acceleration of B is twice that. Okay, then we, we can get T. So I'm, I'm looking at the forces on B as T minus 8G equals 8 times 2A. Um, that's, so 7.81 is the acceleration of B, and we can solve for T. Now, as an aside, I just want to go back to the consideration of forces on a movable pulley. Okay, we could bring the weight into this, of course, but um, for now I just want to look at the forces on the pulley due to the string. So we saw that these two forces are equal, and they act on the part of the string that's in contact with the pulley. So, I'll call that part of the string S, and we're just going to look at the forces on S. 
and by considering the forces on S we can then get the forces on the pulley. So the pulley P is obviously in contact with this piece of string S. So we have a force on the string due to the pulley. I'll write that as F sub SP. So now we can consider the resultant force on the piece of string that's in contact with the pulley. Now this piece of string could be constantly changing, of course. It may not be the same piece of string from moment to moment. But at any particular instant, let's suppose that that piece of string is called S. Um, we know that its mass is zero because the mass of the entire string is zero, so obviously the mass of a section of it is zero. So if we take upwards as positive, we have a force of 2t acting upwards on the string, acting on the ends of it, um, and we have the force on the string due to the pulley. And by Newton's second law, that's the mass of the string by the acceleration of the string. But the mass of the string is zero, so it doesn't matter about the acceleration of the piece that's in contact with the pulley. The resultant force is zero, which tells us that 2t is equal to the force on the string due to the pulley. But now we apply Newton's third law. So by Newton 3, we know that the force on the string due to the pulley is equal in magnitude to the force on the pulley due to the string. So, well, they're equal in magnitude but opposite in direction, obviously. So the force on the pulley due to the string is just 2t. So that explains what I mentioned earlier. You know, this probably makes it even clearer. So this vector here is the force on the pulley due to the string. It's 2t. But of course, I didn't mention the weight of the pulley. The weight of the pulley could come into it. Also, unless the pulley is so light that we can say it's massless.